All right, if you're here last week, last Sunday night, I did an entire sermon covering the subject of angels. And I had wanted to do an entire sermon that kind of covered angels and devils or angels and demons all at once. And there's just way too much content, so I split it up. So tonight we're going to be covering devils, whereas on last Sunday we did on the subject of angels. And whether you, you realize it or not, we are literally in the midst of a spiritual battle. There is a spiritual battle going on around us all the time. And because it's spiritual, it's not something that you can just see with your eyes. And we live in a world that's not just physical world. There are, there, there are plenty of uh, spiritual beings that God has created that exist. And, you know, people may want to mock at that. I brought this up last week. People may want to mock at it and make fun of you or whatever. But it's what the Word of God says. In fact, it is, it is the, the whole Bible is riddled with scriptures about angels and devils. I mean, from cover to cover, you cannot be reading the Bible for any length of time and not run across an angel or devil or a reference to one of them. I mean, they are real. They exist. We have warnings about the devils. We, we have um, encouragement regarding the angels. And this is just a very, a very, very sound reality. Just as much as you believe anything from Scripture, you better believe that angels and devils are real. Now, we started off here in Revelation chapter 12. Great passage you know, describing the devil. Now, a lot of the references that we're going to look to tonight are going to be in regards to Satan or what's, you know, what people know as the devil. Just because there's way more references in Scripture to him, to that particular creature. But we're going to see this from Scripture. We're going to see this in this passage that basically that the devil, Satan, is a fallen angel. He was an angel. God created him to be good, just like all of his creation. But through his own wicked heart, through his own sin, he turned against God. He became a liar. He became uh, an evil, uh, wicked creation. He became an evil angel and now what is known as a devil. So that's the way that uh, you could differentiate between an angel that's a good angel, an angel that's a fallen angel, is that you have angels and devils. And it's, it's a real simple explanation for that. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, we're going to go through this kind of in depth. This one, I get you, there's a lot of imagery here. Um, and, and it's kind of abstract, but we're going to see some great truths here. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, when we read Scripture, if you haven't read a lot, you'll notice, especially in the book of Revelation, the devil can go by the serpent, the dragon, Satan, Lucifer, the devil. There's all these different names and references. So when you see a dragon or a serpent, you're usually talking about either the devil or a devil. And there's, we're not going to get into all the symbolic references and what the horns mean and what all the different heads mean and all that stuff tonight. That's for a different study. But we're going to get some other truths out of this passage. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. I believe that those stars are referring to angels. We see other... Um, mentions in scripture where, where stars are kind of symbolic of angels and we see the devil drawing one third of the stars basically after him. It's not just the devil, it's not just Satan who sinned against God, but he's convinced other angels to basically follow along with him and, and be in rebellion to God. And, uh, and it tells us here is about a third of them. Verse number five, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations. Oh, and before verse number four, What's the purpose of the dragon? What is he trying to do? He's trying to devour the woman's child. This is a reference to Jesus Christ being born. The devil is an adversary. The word Satan literally means adversary. It's the opponent. It's the enemy. It's the, 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 you know, the evil to the good. That's who we're fighting against this, in this spiritual battle. These devils are against all that is good. And you're going to see them standing in opposition and standing contrary to everything that is good in all these references that we're going to see. Verse number five. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. 
And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there for a thousand two hundred and three score, day, three score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So the dragon and his angels is referring to devils. So the dragon has his angels, his followers. There's this war that takes place in heaven. And let me just explain this to you here. In Revelation chapter 12, these events haven't happened yet. This war hasn't taken place in heaven yet. And we're going to prove that in, as we get into some more scripture. It's going to be clear when we get into Job chapter 1 that this hasn't happened yet. But you have to place this time somewhere. So some people say, oh no, this already happened. Satan's already been cast out of heaven. As we keep reading here, I'm going to show you why that doesn't make sense. Also, when we turn to Job chapter 1 and we see Job is in heaven before God and, and he's having conversations with God and communications with God, he wasn't cast out in Job's day. So if he wasn't cast out in Job's day, when did he get cast out if he's already been cast out? When did this war take place? You have to be able to point to some time to say, well, when did that happen? I don't believe this has happened yet. And I think it fits in perfectly with the scripture in Revelation of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, let's keep reading here so I could get to the, to the passage that, that explains it, I think, very, very well. So Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. You say, well, why is it talk about this in past tense? Because that God is outside of time. And when, when these things are being revealed, all of this stuff is, are things that John is seeing. Well, how can he see things that haven't happened yet? It's just as easy as how it could be written as if it already happened in past tense, even though it hasn't happened in our timeline yet. Because this is a revelation. This is a vision. This is something that's been given to him already. And the, the, um, the, the use of tense. God, God speaks of those things that are not as though they were. That, you know, that, that have already happened. The Bible talks about Jesus Christ being a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I was just having a conversation this morning after church about that, how, you know, the question was about Old Testament saints and how, you know, how could they go to heaven? Jesus didn't die on the cross yet, right? You're thinking, well, if he's paid for their sins, how could anyone go to heaven if he hadn't actually been, you know, been crucified on the cross yet? Well, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And trust in God's word, whether or not it actually happened in our timeline, see, God's outside of time. God created time. And this is where you start thinking about this, it can almost make your head hurt, trying to understand what it's like to be outside of time, because we don't know anything about it. We're, we're constrained. We're in this system, in this world, in this universe that revolves around time, that time is a, is a factor in. God's not impacted by time at all. The best way I could explain it was like this, is say, well, you know, God's the author. Imagine you have a book. And we're like in the pages of this book. And as the book's being read, you know, things continue to happen. And that's like time. Well, God's one that already created it from beginning to end. He knows the whole thing. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. It's already done. It's already finished. When you're outside of time. We just happen to be going along through the pages. And we are where we are. God already created everything. It doesn't mean that... that God makes you do anything. He's just outside of time. Whatever it is that you were going to do, you've already done it right. in God's perspective. Right. So anyways, I don't want to get too deep into that. that was a, it was an interesting conversation we had this morning. But um, the whole point is not to get caught up with him referring to this as being in the past tense. Because from God's perspective, it already, it already did happen. And all the things that... that John saw in his revelation, it was like they already happened, even though they hadn't happened yet. Just like Jesus Christ being born, all the prophecies of Jesus Christ happening, how it was going to happen, how it was going to play out, there's going to be a traitor, you know, all the different things that were prophesied. It, it could have just been as like it already had happened because that's what's going to happen because God's true to his word every time. So anyways, let's keep reading here. I'm getting a little bit too far off and there's a lot of scripture to go through on, on the subject of devils. So there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So basically when they lose this battle, they're kicked out of heaven. They can't go back into heaven again. There's no more place for them to, to go into heaven at all. 
Um, we see from earlier passages in regards to angels, we think of uh, Jacob. When he was in Bethel, he saw the angels ascending and descending upon the earth. So we know that angels go back and forth between the earth and heaven. We know that uh, Satan does the same thing. We'll see that in Job chapter 1 when we get there. But at this point, when this battle takes place, the devils, Satan, no more are they allowed in heaven. They're kicked out. And it says in verse number 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. There's another attribute. Satan is a deceiver. He's out to try to trick people. He's out to try to confuse people. To not know the truth. That's one of the purposes of Satan. That's what he wants to do. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. That's another thing that Satan does is he's an accuser. It says, Which accused them before our God day and night. So what Satan does is he deceives he lies, and then he goes and tries to accuse you to God. So anytime that you're messing up, you screw up, you sin, Satan's going to try to get you to sin, and then he's going to go and, and accuse you to God and be the tattletale and say, oh God, look what he did, look what, you know, because he's evil, because he's wicked. This is what he does. Um, Verse number 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So once the devil is kicked out of heaven, no longer allowed back in at all, the Bible is saying, well, woe unto the world, because whoever's left in the world now, the devil is full of wrath. He's really angry now that he's been kicked out. And it says, he knows that he only has a short time. This is the event that kicks off the great tribulation in Scripture. And I'm not going to flesh this whole thing out. We've got the DVDs out there called After the Tribulation. You can check that out. They're free. Take one home with you. But... Um, this is the event that kicks it off, that starts it off, that where the devil starts really persecuting and going after God's people because he has great wrath because he already lost the battle in heaven. He's kicked out of heaven now. So now he's going to go and just, and just lay into God's people here on earth. It says in verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And, you know, one more reason to believe that this war hasn't happened yet is because when he's kicked out it says he has just a short time. Well, how long ago do you think that this might have happened? If it, if it hasn't happened yet, when did it happen? And has that really been a short time? According to the timeline in Scripture of, of when this happens, he basically is going to have about three and a half years before God starts pouring out his wrath. That's not a very long time. Now, if this happened in the day of, you know, at the time of Christ, well, it's already been 2,000 years. Would you really say that that's not, that's a short time? I wouldn't call that a short time. I don't think that's happened yet. Let's flip over to Revelation chapter 16. And again, I don't want to get too much into prophecy and end times and stuff because that's not the scope of this sermon tonight. But um, it's important to understand what we can about devils because they are the adversary. That, that is the spiritual battle that we are to be engaged against is against the spiritual wickedness in high places. It's, it, this is the warfare that's going on. And that's, why, that's one of the reasons why we need the help of the angels. Yep. Listen to last week's sermon. Because of this spiritual battle that's going on. Revelation chapter 16, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils 
working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And the reason why I had you turn here is because of what's written there in verse number 14 about the spirits of devils. They're actually able to work miracles. And in the end times, and again, this is another reason to, to be aware of this, is that the Bible says there's going to be false Christs that, are arise, that will arise and they'll be able to perform miracles in so much that if it were possible, they could deceive the very elect. They're saying that the miracles are going to be so convincing that these false Christs, false prophets will be able to do. It's going to draw a lot of people in into thinking, wow, this must be the power of God. And it won't be. And see, God's already given us the information to tell us this isn't of God. If someone's trying to tell you, oh, here's Christ or lo there, believe him not. The Bible says, for as the lightning uh, uh, stretches forth across the sky, even so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, that, that you know, every eye shall see. There's not going to be a doubt when Jesus Christ comes back. It's like, yes, the Lord's coming back right now. It's not, oh, here's this person over here or that person over there claiming to be Christ. Oh, but look at all these miracles that they're doing. Don't fall for it. Amen. And the Bible's saying that if you're saved, you won't fall for it. Amen. And that's a good, that's a blessing. Yeah. That, that he said, if it were possible, he should deceive the very elect in Matthew 24. But that's because it's not possible. But it is going to deceive a lot of people. There are spirits of devils that are capable of working miracles. See, well, why would they work miracles? Just to, to deceive people. Just to trick people into thinking that this is of God. Turn to, um, well, I'll just read this for you. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. We already went over this, I believe, last week. But Ezekiel 28 gives a specific reference to Satan. I'm going to read this for you again. I don't think we covered a whole lot of this. You're turning to Deuteronomy 32. I'm going to read from Ezekiel 28, verse number 12. The Bible says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. I, I mentioned this last week. It's talking about thou hast been in Eden. This isn't talking about the physical, literal king of Tyrus at the time, the king of Tyre. This is talking about Satan, which was the spiritual king at that time over the city of Tyre, who was influencing the physical king on the earth because this is talking about someone that's been in Eden. As I mentioned last week, who is in Eden? Adam and Eve and the serpent, right? That's who we know was in Eden. And it's not Adam or Eve that he's talking about here. He's talking about Satan. He's talking about the devil. And it tells us some more information. It says that Satan was filled with wisdom and perfect in beauty. God created the devil. God created Satan or Lucifer to be a very beautiful creature. Physically just appealing or, you know, what you look at Satan with your eyes, very beautiful creature. And then it goes in and lists off all these stones, these precious stones that are going to be, again, very appealing to the eye. And then it says that the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created, referring to giving us a sense that he's a musical creature as well. Tabrets, pipes, probably designed by God literally to be able to just provide music and to be something that's glorious and, 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 and pleasing to look on in the presence of God. The Bible calls him the anointed cherub or the covering cherub that he's covering. He very well may be one of the, the cherubs that was supposed to cover the mercy seat because you have the, the wings of the cherubs that were touching and cover the mercy seat when you read through the book of all those boring books, when you read through all those chapters in Exodus and you're just like, why am I getting all this detail? Well, there's a reason for it. it, it you know, it may, it may be kind of dry reading sometimes, but it actually is very interesting. And, and you start applying in these other areas that everything that was created on earth with the tabernacle is what already exists in heaven. So when you have these, these images or these pictures or these statues of, of angels or cherubs 
That's what really exists in heaven. That's why they created that way. There's a mercy seat in heaven. Jesus sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat and, and granted us forgiveness of sins. But there's also these cherubs. And it says here in verse number 14 of Ezekiel 28, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So that is the Lord pronouncing his judgment against Lucifer. Turn to, you're in Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're studying devils tonight. We're trying to learn what we can about them. Satan is a very proud creature. He was lifted up in his own pride because he was created so beautifully, because he was so wonderful, because he had this position. He was the anointed cherub. He was basically at the top. He was like the top angel that, that God created. And because of all of this, because of his beauty, because of his, his musical talents or whatever, he was lifted up in himself and he wanted to be God. He wants to be like the Most High. It wasn't enough for him to be how God created him. He wanted more. And then, uh, um, of course, that led him into sin and iniquity. We see that the devils are out to deceive. They're out to destroy. They're, they're, they're evil creatures. We also are going to see here in Deuteronomy 32 that the, the false gods that exist... You think about why are there so many gods? Why, why do people, why are there so many religions? Why are there all these weird things? Why is there this Buddha and this, and the, you know, these, you know, some people worship animals and calves and like, why, why is there just so much of this stuff? You think about if the Bible's true, which it is, and Adam and Eve were in the garden and they had great communication with God. And then you've got people throughout history where God's communicating with them. Where in the world did all this other stuff come from? Where, where did these other, why would anyone decide just to worship some, some statue or some stone? Well, part of it has to do with them being lifted up in their own pride, as Romans 1 suggests. But also when they, when they find these strange gods that they worship, the Bible tells us they're actually worshiping devils. It's the devils that are causing people to worship these other things. These other religions are spawned by the influence of devils. That's where they come from. That's ultimately where these false religions come from. They come from devils. And you can think about, the, there's, there's some very major religions that exist today that I very firmly believe were 100% without a doubt started by devils. One of them being Islam, the, the, the Muslim religion. If you go back and you read what, you know, what the religion is founded on, I was just speaking to a Muslim today, and there's a lot of things that he didn't know. But um, unfortunately, I, I gave him a lot of, a lot of truth, and he, and he received it pretty well, so I'm hopeful that the guy will end up getting saved. But when you, when you understand, you know, their religion is based on the prophet Muhammad. I mean, they say they believe in the Bible and that they believe in all these other prophets and stuff, and Muhammad is just another prophet. But just like with any other cult or these false religions, it still all boils down to one person. I mean, if you're going to read something in the Bible that contradicts what their prophet said, they're going to go with their prophet. Yeah. Just like the Mormons and Joseph Smith, and we'll get to him in a minute too. If you're going to believe, if you're going to read something in the Bible, like, oh, well, that just wasn't translated right if it contradicts whatever their prophet says. Because they're not trusting in the Bible. They're not trusting in the Holy Word. They're trusting in whatever it is that their one prophet says. Now, when it comes to Muhammad, it's recorded that he was receiving uh, his information from angels. He was having visions. He was getting his writings and he was having his supernatural experiences. And you know what? I believe that that's true. 
I actually believe he was having some experiences that he was getting these writings, but he wasn't dealing with a good guy or good person or good angel. He was dealing with a devil, a devil that loves the praise, that wants to be lifted up, that's lifted up in pride, that can get people to worship him, Amen. to worship this, this false God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 13, look at verse number 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils. So it just talks about the strange gods and then it says they sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up whom your fathers feared not. These new gods, these new religions, this, oh, we're going to worship this way, oh, we're going to do that. They're coming from devils. Yeah. That is the source. That is what the scripture is teaching us here in Deuteronomy 32. Look at verse number 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Let's read that again. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. What does abhor mean? It means hate. He hated them. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. This is a very big deal. This gets God's anger and wrath stirred up more than just about anything else is when God, the creator of everything, the one who's given you life, who's given you breath, who's given you all good things that you have, for have the creation turn and just say, yeah, it's, you're not God. I'm just going to believe in, in this, some object. I'm going to believe in some other thing, and that's going to be my God, and that's what I'm going to give credence to. I'm going to give respect unto this creation instead of the creator himself. And that makes God angry. That makes God jealous. No, he's, God's deserving of that devotion. God's deserving of that affection, not some false God. And, and there's serious consequences to that uh, as a result. Um, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, you could turn there if you'd like. I brought up Muhammad, but Joseph Smith was the same way. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, actually claimed to have communication with angels. He claimed to, to get his doctrine and receive his special understanding of the gold tablets and of all these other things and, and these special books that he got this from inspiration or under the uh, uh, direction of angels. And he was another one. Whether, whether he actually had that... There's some doubt on whether or not he actually had those experiences. Just because the guy is a charlatan, he's a known crook, he's a known criminal, he's just been known to deceive people in the past already, prior to starting his own religion, he was already just a charlatan. And that's a fact. I mean, you could just look up information. There's records in the United States of him being a criminal and being prosecuted as a criminal, as a charlatan. There's a reason why he was kicked out of Illinois. There's a reason why he wasn't allowed there when he started, you know, he started his religion. But let's say it's true. Let's say he had some type of angelic revelation. Well, it wasn't coming from God. And the, the best way to test these things anyways is you compare what we know is from God, what we know has been tried and true, that we know that words have come to pass in the Holy Scripture, and then compare that with these other writings. Compare that with the Book of Mormon. Compare that with the Quran, and see, do these match up? Oh, wait, no, they contradict each other. Actually, they contradict each other tremendously. You've got the Book of Mormon saying you've got to repent of all of your sins in order to be saved. That's never found once in the Scripture. You've got the word repent, but you do not have repent of all your sins to be saved. Not one time is that found in the Holy Bible. The Bible talks about salvation being a free gift, not of works. And you got the Book of Mormon saying, well, it's not of works after all that you can do. Or it's by grace after all that you can do. You have to do all this work, and then when you've done everything else, then it's going to be by grace. Then it's going to be not of works. It doesn't make any sense, but that's what their book says. It's not of God. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. Another warning 
about devils here and about Satan himself. Uh, verse number 13, and false prophets. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers. They're liars. They deceive. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Why, are they so, why would they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ? I thought they hate Christ. I thought they don't have anything to do with God and with Christ. Because they want to deceive. So the best way that they could gain your confidence is to try to make themselves look like someone who's good. They want to draw you in and make you think, hey, I'm a, I'm a good person. Hey, listen to me. I'm, I'm dressed in a nice suit. I'm looking good. I've got a Bible in my hand. Right? I'm going to play the part and I'm going to dress up in this sheepskin so that you don't realize I'm a wolf. Right. That's what they're doing. So they transform themselves into apostles of Christ, these false apostles, these false teachers. They want to make themselves look like, hey, they're one of the group. They're, they're one of the good guys, but they're not. And he says in verse 14, he's explaining this about the false apostles that were around during this time. He says, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan's going to look like a good guy. I mean, his word Lucifer, he's the, he's the light bearer. He's bringing light. And even some Luciferian religions, which Mormonism is a Luciferian religion, by the way, will paint Lucifer, who they say is Jesus' brother, as not being that bad of a guy, ultimately. In the Mormon religion, well, Elohim just chose Jesus' plan over Lucifer's plan. But it wasn't that Lucifer's plan was just that bad, but Elohim just, just liked Jesus' plan better instead of, instead of Lucifer's plan. And there's many Luciferian religions that just say, they'll, they'll look at the Garden of Eden and say, he did a good thing. I mean, isn't it good to have, to have knowledge of good and evil? Isn't that good just to have more knowledge and more wisdom? I mean, God's the bad one for preventing them from knowing things. See, Satan was just giving them something good. He was trying to help them out. Hey, aren't you glad that you have wisdom and knowledge and stuff? That's the way people portray it. But they're totally missing. What, they've forgotten. What about the innocence? You see this in kids. Isn't it great to see the innocence in children? Wouldn't that be a thing to be desired? If you could live in innocency and not in sin, and not even have to know good and evil, and just exist and live in total innocency like a child does. That's what God gave us. It was through sin of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that all of a sudden Adam's like, oh, we're, we're naked. Oh, we, you know, now you have to deal with all the consequences of sin. It's much better to be in innocency as a child. But, see, they, they want to spin it as Lucifer's not that bad of a guy. He was actually trying to help. And that's how, that's how Satan wants to be seen as. And that's why, you know, he transforms himself into an angel of light. He wants to gain your confidence. He wants to make you think that he's really not that bad. Verse number 15, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Um, turn to John chapter number 8. So once we realize here, because these devils, these false prophets and devils want to be seen, they want to be trusted, they want to be looked on as angels of light, as good people, it's also possible for them to say things that could sound really good or even say things that, that sound right or truthful. Um, the Bible says, you know, and this happened many times when Jesus or the apostles are, are casting out devils out of people, the devils would say things that were true or correct. In, this, in uh, Luke 4, 41, the Bible says, and devils also came out of many crying out and saying, thou art Christ, the son of God. See, we can't have this wrong concept of a devil not even being able to acknowledge that Jesus is Christ. Well, they do believe that. They know that. The devils back in these days, they were saying, hey, we know who you are. Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. 
And they were right when they were saying those things. That was true. They were correct. It was absolutely 100% true that they were saying that that's who Jesus was. So just because a devil may say something that's right like that doesn't make them good. And the devils are going to try to say things just enough to gain your confidence to then steer you down the wrong path. Try to say enough of what you want to hear, of what, of what you know to be true, in order to deceive you and, uh, and, and cause utter destruction. Um, the Bible says in John 8, 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan is the father of all lies. With devils, you're getting deception, uh, guile, trickery. Um, turn to oh, turn to Matthew chapter four. And this is all the more reason why we need to beware. And this is all the more reason why you need to read your scripture. If devils are out to deceive, if devils are out to trick you, how are you going to know if what you're hearing from? is of the devil or is of God. How are you even going to know unless you know the word of God? And we're going to see the perfect example of this in Matthew chapter 4. And this should give us hope as to how we can know we can resist the devil and how we can know what's true. If we do know the word of God, Jesus Christ was tempted of Satan himself in Matthew chapter 4. And how did he answer the devil every single time that the devil's trying to tempt him, trying to get him to sin, trying to, trying to trick him in, into, into sinning? He answers him with scripture every single time. He says, no, nope, I know what you're doing here, but this is what the scripture says. This is what God's word says. This is why I'm not going to listen to you. This is why I'm not going to do what you're saying to do. Because of God's word, because of what I know this book says. And that's how you are not going to be deceived either. Because, look, think about it. The devil's... These are, these are angels that have been around for a really long time. A really long time. And, I, I, you know, the, these Pentecostal groups that want to, you know, call out the devil and they, and they speak real hard against these devils and stuff, you better watch out for that because the Bible talks about the angels being mighty in power yeah. and that they are mightier than us. And even Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he durst not bring forth a railing accusation against him. I mean, when durst means he didn't dare. He didn't dare do it. Because he knows who he's dealing with, and that's Michael, the archangel. We are humans. We don't need to go picking fights with devils. Now, there is a spiritual war going on, and I'm not saying we back down from any opposition, but the Bible talks about us getting the armor of God, that we could be strong and we could stand. It doesn't say we need to go forth and destroy all the devils and Satan. We can't do that. We need to be able to stand, and that's how we're going to resist in the fight, is just by being able to get through it. And you know who's going to win the victory for us? God in heaven. God will end up casting them to hell. God will take care of them ultimately. We can't. But we can resist. We can make them flee and go and, and, and run away from us. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that's exactly what he did with Jesus Christ as well. Jesus resisted the devil and the devil fled from him. Look at chapter, verse number 1 of Matthew chapter 4. The Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So the devil's just trying to get him, you know, Jesus is fasting. He's fasting for a purpose, and the devil's trying to get him to eat. He's attacking a weakness of the flesh that Jesus had, had being in the form of man. When you're fasting and you're refusing food, what's happened? You're going to get hungry. And the longer you go without food, the more hungry you're going to get. And that's going to be a weak point where you could be susceptible to breaking, you know, his fast or whatever before he intended on doing it. And 
That's what Satan's trying to do. He's trying to get him to stop being spiritual, stop doing what he's doing, stop his fast. Well, Jesus wasn't ready to stop his fast yet. And the devil's trying to tempt him into doing that. And how does he do it? Oh, you could, hey, if you're God, and he's also saying, hey, if, if, if you really are God, why don't you make this stone turn into bread? Why don't you just eat it then? I mean, you're hungry anyways. You might as well just do it. And this is what the, the atheists lately have been commenting. Well, well, if you're really saved, then why don't you just drink some poison then, huh? I mean, the Bible says that if you're, you know, if you're saved, then it's not going to hurt you, so why don't you just do it? It's exactly the same attitude that Satan had. No surprise. Verse number five, but he, the devil continues, though. So Jesus answers him. He doesn't stop with that, with that one uh, with that one attack, look at verse number five. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a, pin a pinnacle of the temple. Now, what I want to point out here, and this is something that's really interesting, is what the devil or devils can and can't do. Now, first of all, we need to understand when we're dealing with angels or devils, they are created beings. They are not God. Right. You know, the devil is an adversary, but it's not like the devil is the bad God. There's only one God. So God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And he's omniscient. He knows everything. Those are attributes of God. Okay? God can be everywhere at all times. Jesus Christ can say, you know, the Son of Man, which is in heaven, while he's on this earth, and say he's in heaven because he's God, because he has that attribute of God of being able to be ever. He could say to the thief on the cross, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise when he's going to be in hell, even though he can say that to the thief because he's God, because it's an attribute of God. The devil doesn't have that attribute. So, hey, this is good news for us. The devil can't just be everywhere at one time. If he's going to be picking a fight somewhere, he's going to be picking a fight there, right? It's going to be... And there's lots of places all over the world for him to be fighting people. And the devils are the same thing. They're created beings. So they are limited in what they can do. However, they are mighty in power and they do have some things as spiritual creatures that they can do. Now, I'm not saying I understand all of this completely, but we are given information about this and we see what happened with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in the wilderness fasting. Yet look at what it says in verse number five here. Let's reread this. It says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Remember, the angels have wings. The devil is a, is a cherub. He's anointed cherub. He's got wings. He's able to just pick Jesus up and fly him over to this pinnacle on the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then look at verse number 8. It says, And the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. So this stuff is happening. I don't think this has taken very much time for him to do all this stuff either. He's taking him and moving quickly, and he's going to the pin just to the top of a temple. And then he's going to the top of a mountain, an exceeding high mountain. He's just whoosh, scoop him up, goes to this exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. But we get a little bit more information in Luke 4. Stay in Matthew 4. In Luke 4, chapter 5, it talks about the same event. It says, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So somehow, the devil has this power, this capability to relay in front of Jesus, to make Jesus perceive, as a human being, perceive all of the kingdoms of the world. Because it doesn't matter what high mountain you go to, you're not going to see all the kings of the world from anywhere. I mean, you go to any mountain, yeah, you can see far, but you're still limited what you can see. This is, is a supernatural power that the devil has in order to impart on people. This is another reason why I think some people get deceived by devils. Because if you're dealing with a devil that's able to do things like this, you might think, wow, there's a lot of power here. This is pretty cool. Yeah, I want to do that. And I, I personally believe that there are people that sell their soul to the devil for fame and fortune and power and for this promise of all these kingdoms of the world and things like that. 
I believe that. Yeah. Now, we see an example here of the devil offering this unto Jesus Christ. And I think people fall for the trap. And it is a trap. Because, first of all, whatever you get in this world, it's only here for a moment. You're here and you're gone. Your life is like a vapor. Here for a, bit, a time and then vanishes away. So whatever it is that you get that you think is so great, that's not going to last very long. Yeah. But secondly, even, you know, the, the riches are deceitful. The Bible talks about the deceitfulness of riches. It's never going to fill you up. It's never going to make you complete. No matter how much you have, there's still going to be an empty hole. It doesn't ever fix whatever it is you think is going to fix your problems. No matter how much you have, it won't make you happy. And that's just the way it works. It's a, it's a trap. It's a, it's a snare of the devil. The devil wants to make everything look so good and have this great appearance. But when you actually get it, it's nothing. It's void. It's empty. But it's interesting that he has his power. So he's able to take Jesus, transform, and then all of a sudden they're back in the wilderness again. It says in uh, Matthew 4, 9, And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And so what does he want? Worship. He said, I'll give you all this stuff because this, because he's saying, this has all been given to me. And the Bible does refer to Satan as the God of this world. And that he has this, this control and this power over people in this world. He said, these are all my kingdoms, all the kings of the earth. That's why I say all the governments of the world are wicked. To one degree or another, the God of this world is, is reigning over him and exerting his power on him. But he said, I'll give you all this stuff. Just worship me. He just wants to be that praise like he's God. He wants to be in the praise of God because God is the only one that, that is deserving of uh, worship. The verse, uh, verse number 10, Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Let's turn to Job chapter 1. Man, I'm getting over time already. Job chapter 1. Right before the book of Psalms, if you open up your Bible kind of right in the dead center, you're gonna, you should probably end up in the book of Psalms. Right before the book of Psalms, you're going to find the book of Job. We're going to look at Job chapter number 1. Even though angels and devils are spirits, they have impact into the physical world. They were able to carry Jesus. They are able to show him things. And we're going to see what happens now in Job chapter 1 and 2, what happens with Job's family as a result of Satan directly. What Satan is able to do to a believer. And, by the way, how he's able to make it appear is also just as important as what he's able to do. And this is why this is extremely important to understand that the deceiver is going to try to make things appear as if they're coming from God, as if they're coming from a different source and not from him or for a different reason and try to confuse you and make you think, oh, this bad thing's happening. Just like all of Job's friends. Well, what did you do, Job? Where's your sin, Job? Huh? You must have done something wicked, Job, because not this, this stuff. There's no way any of this stuff would have happened to you unless you're doing something wicked, Job. And was Job guilty? No. No, not according to God. God Almighty said it wasn't anything that he did. And we see here that it was Satan that was actually accusing Job. And Satan was the one that kept on trying to get God to allow him to do all these things against him. Look at uh, verse number one. The Bible says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Job was a good man. And it tells us about his substance and his sons and his daughters and, and how it is that he, he cared about his, his children so much that he would do sacrifices for them and just, just in case they were not right with God. I mean, Job was a great person. And it says here, look at verse number six. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to prevent themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. So the sons of God, these are believers in heaven that came to prevent themselves, present themselves before the Lord. They're coming for God. Here we are, God. You know, whatever it is that God wants them to do, to hear from Him, to worship Him, whatever, they come before God in heaven, believers in the Lord, sons of God, and then Satan's coming along with them. So this is just proving, first of all, Satan at this point hadn't been cast out of heaven yet because 
He had a place in heaven. He was there. He's able to come before the Lord, just like believers are able to come before him, just like children of God are able to come before him. Verse number seven, and the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? So he's saying, well, Satan, where do you come from? Where have you been? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So, well, I was out in the earth. Now I'm up in heaven. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? You're saying, hey, what do you think about my servant Job, huh? He's a pretty good guy. He's doing, doing some good things. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. He's saying, oh yeah, sure. He seems to be real, in real good standing with you now, but you know, you've done all this stuff for him. I mean, of course he's going to be a good guy. You've blessed him. You've, you've given him all this stuff. You've protected him. You've, you've hedged him about. And he's saying, you get rid of his stuff, though. I guarantee you he's going to curse you to your face. This is the accuser. This is, this is Satan saying this to God. Is that true? Nope. But he wants to accuse him. And this is what Satan does against all the children of God. Satan is always trying to accuse you. And we have to understand that, that he's out there. And just one more reason for us to try to live uprightly. Because there's someone that's going to be trying to accuse you to the Lord. And it's Satan. And it says uh, here, let's keep reading. Um, Verse number 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So God gives him, God allows for Satan to do what he's going to do. God gives him permission to do something. Now, this isn't God doing this to Job. Satan is the one doing it. But God is just allowing it to happen. He's not preventing it from happening. But that's not the same as God doing it, first of all, just, just so you're aware of that. I mean, if someone, when people do bad things in this life, it's not because God did them. God may allow certain things to happen. God doesn't always intervene on every single thing that happens in this world because we're not just total robots down here. God allows people to sin and then sin has repercussions and people end up getting hurt, but it's not God doing those things. Verse number 13 says, And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So we're going to look at all these different ways. Satan has coordinated these attacks against Job and against his family, against his substance, against his children, against all that Job has. So when it says the Sabaeans fell upon them, it's because Satan influenced the Sabaeans to go and attack. That he actually had the influence to go make them go and do these things. And he also, it, it's co when you understand the level of coordination he has here, because Job starts receiving this news and there's just messenger after messenger after messenger, like just practically lined up to telling so tell him something bad that happened. All in a very short period of time. He's able to get all of these different events to happen masterfully. Yes. Just, just understand that. This isn't, this isn't just some dope, you know, some, some idiot that you don't have to really worry about. Satan is, is a formidable adversary and one not to be taken lightly. Verse number 16, while he was yet speaking, there came also another. So this guy hasn't even finished telling him all that happened. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven. Now, is this the fire of God? No, but is that what it looked like? You betcha. So Satan had the power to be able to make fire come down from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So he's talking about his servants dying. He's talking about his oxen and his sheep being destroyed. And by very unusual circumstances. Now, the first one you could say, well, okay, they were robbed. You could, you could write that one off. 
But now he's talking about fire coming down from heaven. Well, where in the world is that coming from? And then look at verse 17. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So now he's talking about a different group, not the Sabaeans. This is a Chaldean. So it's different. It's not like it's the same. Well, maybe there's, you know, this country's coming after me, whatever. No, it's different groups of people coming after him all at the same time. Verse 18, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. That's pretty serious. You start thinking one after the other, after the other, all of his substance, all the way down to his children. Some tornado came and, and knocked the house down and they all, everybody died. Well, that's going to start making you think, who can do this? And what Job did, he did not charge God foolishly. And this is righteousness in Job. Look at verse number three. Then Job arose and rent his mat mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Amen. It's a great testimony unto Job. But the whole purpose of us even going over this is to see this is the power that devils have. This is the power that Satan has to coordinate such an attack in such a way to make people think, Why is God doing this to me? Now, Job had the right attitude. Hey, God blessed me and gave me a whole abundance and now it's all taken away. Well, bless the name of the Lord. God is still good. And you know what? God is still good. Yeah, that's right. Amen. And this wasn't God doing this to Job. And then we're not going to go through chapter two, but basically God's like, well, what do you think about Job? You know, he still hasn't cursed me like you said he was going to. He said, like, oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, because he still has his health, that's why. And then, he, he allows uh, Satan to, to um, afflict him again. And then Satan gives him this horrible disease where he's got these boils and he's just itchy and, and miserable. And the reason why I'm covering all of this and taking the time is to show you all the different power that the devils have right. and what they're capable of doing. And also, as a great lesson from, from Job in general is not just to assume when weird things or supernatural type things seem to be happening to someone, just assume that, well, God must be punishing them. Because God wasn't punishing Job. Job didn't do anything worthy of, of punishment. Um, not, not like this at all. Uh, turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. It's kind of a different sermon, you know, last week and this week with the angels and devils. I just want you to understand as much as possible about these creatures, about angels, about devils, because they, they do matter in, this, in the spiritual battle that we're in. Mark chapter 5, in the whole book of Mark, you're going to see more stories of people who are possessed with devils than in any of the other Gospels, but um, in any other book of the Bible, really. And I want you to, to remember here, well, last week we covered the strength of angels and their might and the power that they have. Well, devils are just fallen angels, so they have that same strength, they're the same creatures. And that is why a possessed person can have such strength as they do, because it's the power that's literally coming from the, the devil or the angel that's, that's possessed that person. And I think that this also could potentially explain... I don't know if you've heard of situations where people have like gotten this, this strength to be able to lift up cars. Like there's been a bad accident and someone's trying to save like a child and it's just totally unexplained. And there's these stories of people like able to just lift up cars and things they'd never be able to do. Yeah. I think it would make sense that that can be the result of an angel helping a human being to be able to do those things. See, when it comes to devils, devils can possess people and like take over and kind of dwell inside of another person. 
Now, they could only do that with people who are unsaved because saved people have the Holy Spirit of God residing inside of you that could ward off any devils that would try to do that. But unsaved people can have devils literally possess them and take possession of the body. And that's why you have stories. And even in Mark chapter 5, we see an example of someone possessed that had supernatural strength because the strength came from the devil, not from the person himself. Mark 5, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man can bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. So he, I mean, he's literally at shackles. I mean, they tried just, just shackling this guy up. He's crazy. He's possessed, right? And they would try just putting these, these handcuffs on him and shackles, and he's able to just bust through them. Why? Because he had the, the, the power of the unclean spirit that was in him. Satan and the devils are adversaries. They are set on opposing us. So we need to be aware of that power, be aware of what they're capable of doing. The Bible says in Ephesians 6.11, I already alluded to this, it says in Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That is our fight. That is our battle. It's not a physical one. We're not looking to go and, and turn vigilantes and start getting, you know, arresting people or killing people or whatever that are going against the word of God. That's not our fight at all. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual fight. And um, this does have to do with angels and devils and has to do with spiritual wickedness in high places and against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That is the fight. That's who's going to oppress us and go after us. And that's who we are fighting against. The Bible tells us in, in we're almost done here. Turn to... Um, Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. <coughs> the Bible warns in Revelation chapter 2 as the, the letters are being given out to different churches. Revelation 2.10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribu tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you thee a crown of life. The devil is able to, uh, to get things happen, get people thrown into prison in this world. The Bible says in Luke 8, 12, those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. This is all about people who hear the word of God, but they don't receive it right away. They don't believe it. They hear it, but they're like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they don't fully understand it. They're not rejecting it, but they're just, they're just, kind of getting it for the first time and they're like, I don't know, I need to think about that some more, right? I'm not ready to make a decision right now. So they hear the gospel, but then what does Satan do? Satan's able to, to just remove that word that was sown from their heart. And again, I don't know exactly how he's able to do that, but just kind of like take it out of their memory, take it out of their mind, distract them with something else to just completely forget about what they've been told from scripture. Why would he do that? Because he's evil. There's no real good answer for it other than that. Why would the devil want to have more people in hell? Because that's where he's going. And misery loves company. John chapter 13 explains that it's the devil that put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. John 13 verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end, and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. The devil is there doing it. The devil is coordinating and making plans and using his pawns, using human beings to do his will. He's using children of the devil. There's children of God, there's children of the devil. Hey, when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're born again. You become a child of God. And praise the Lord, you are a child of God forever. You have eternal life. You've got the Holy Spirit residing within you. You are on God's side. Amen. But just as there are children of God, there are children of the devil. 
And just as when you have your spiritual birth into God's family, you can never lose it. You can never be unborn. You are a child. Once you're a child, you're always a child. Well, when, once someone's born into, the, into Satan's family, they're in Satan's family forever. There is no more hope for them. They're what the Bible calls a reprobate. They become rejected. They are, you know, when, when people are made a proselyte, like the false prophets, when the Bible talks about the Pharisees making proselytes, they make them twofold more child of hell than themselves. They are children of the devil, and they go out seeking to recruit other people to convert them to be children of the devil as well. And once someone is a reprobate, once someone has just rejected the Lord, and they go off into, into whatever, into these false gods, and, and they become like devils, they become like their father, the devil, they're in that family forever. And that's, again, part of the, the spiritual warfare that's going on, is, is between the, the children of God and the children of the devil. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, look at verse number 8, where I had you turn. Verse number 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The warning is all throughout Scripture, whether it be about the false prophet, about the devils. Here it's about Satan, about the devil. He's like a roaring lion. Roaring lion's scary. I mean, we typically only have our, our confrontation with a roaring lion behind bars in a cage where you could feel pretty safe. But when you're out in the wilderness and you hear that roaring lion that you think is probably right on the other side of some bush or some tree or something, you're going to be, you know, pretty scared. It's a pretty scary place to be in. Now, we don't have to be scared of the devil, but we do have to know what he's all about. He is like a roaring lion, and he does want to devour people. He wants to devour you. He wants you to, to get back into sin. He wants you, whatever, whatever sin that you've dealt with in the past, he wants you going right back into that sin. Yep, right. He wants to drag you back. He's going to try to get you to think on things, try to, try to put it in your heart, to go back and do those drugs, go back and get into alcohol, go back into that pornography, going back into whatever it is that that sin was. Satan's going to try to get that in front of you and get that in your heart and talk in your ear or however it is that he's going to try to influence you to get you into those sins. Especially as a born again believer because he can't possess you, can't make you do anything, but he could stand at your right hand and oppose you. Like he opposed David, he got David to sin. He got David to number the children of Israel. How did he do that? He stirred up a, a, a force. He, he made him start to, to get scared against uh, some other people that might come up and attack him. He tried to use fear. The devil has a lot of, a lot of tools at his disposal. And, and the Bible tells us that we shouldn't be ignorant of his devices. So we're not ignorant. You shouldn't be ignorant. When you know what could be coming, then you're going to be a lot stronger, a lot more ready to resist. The Bible says, I want to close with this verse, Luke 22, verse 31. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. He said, Satan wants to get you, Peter. He wants to sift you. He wants to shake you up. He wants to rattle you. He wants to get you out of the fight. He wants to destroy you. He says, But I have prayed for thee. Jesus Christ, he said, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He said, I prayed for you. He didn't say, I prayed for you that no tribulation or persecution is going to happen. He said, I prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. Because the attacks are going to come. They are. We saw in Revelation, they are coming. And Satan is going to wage war once he's ki ki kicked out of heaven, when he's cast out. He's going to be more mad than he's ever been, and he's going to turn everything up more than it ever has been throughout history because he knows he only has a short period of time. So once it's, once it's go time, it's okay, because it's the, the, the devil's got a lot of patience. He's able to to really work his way in and get his infiltrators in and, and, and be able to destroy people slowly. He doesn't have to do it all at once. 
But when he realizes he has a short time, that's when things kick into high gear and then it's okay, off with their heads. And that is what's going to happen during the Great Tribulation. There is going to be persecution and tribulation against God's people such as never it was known in the world before. You hear about the martyrs, you hear about the persecutions, you hear about what other Christians have gone through throughout history. The Bible talks about the Great Tribulation being worse than all of those things. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. We need to understand that there are angels. We need to understand that there are devils. We need to understand what their purpose is, what their powers are. But hey, praise God that we've got a God that's more powerful than any of them. Let's not be deceived or let our guard down into thinking, oh yeah, that's just, those are just fairy tales. That's not really real. Well, you can say that, but we're looking at Holy Scripture. So if you want to call God's Word a fable or a, a fairy tale, I'm sorry for you. I, don't, <laughs> I hope that you repent, change your mind, and, and believe that this is God's Word and it is actually true. Because this is reality, my friends. This is what's going on in the world around us. And um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much uh, for giving us all the instruction and helping us understand the things that we can't see around us, Lord. Um, I know there's a lot that we still don't know about what happens in the spiritual realm, but I pray that you would please just give us wisdom and instruction and help us to understand your words, help us to make good choices, and that our faith would fail not. Lord, I pray for everybody here that um, especially when the attacks might come, the persecutions might come, that their faith won't fail. Lord, strengthen us as a church. Strengthen everyone here tonight. Help us to, to just be more grounded and, and stay true to your words. Help us all to know and study your word so that we won't be deceived when, uh, when the attacks do come to try to get us to sin against you, Lord, but that we can be strong. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.